we're going to start off the messages by having a time of uh, just a conversation with different members in our congregation about this topic right here, which is the cross of Jesus led me to change this in my life. And so we're going to be able to hear just from different members in our congregation of what the cross of Jesus led them to change. And we're going to really just have a conversation about that. And uh, from there, we'll lead into the message that we'll be getting into this Sunday. So with that, today we have Andre. <laughs> And so, Andre, I want to ask the question. The cross of Jesus led you to change what in your life? Well, that's a great question, Harris. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I've thought about this question a lot. And one of the things for me, like the cross of uh, Jesus led me to change, was my perception and my understanding of what manhood is, what masculinity is. Um, and... You know, so for me growing up, you know, the men in my life, you know, my dad included, my brothers, everything was a very self-focused. You know, it was like, you know, you know, how does this affect my life? You know, how how can things, um, how can this add to my life? So it was all self-focused. That was even a question I would often ask. You know, people were telling me different things. I would ask, okay, that's a great story, but how does this affect me? So very, very selfish. Very, very selfish. And so selfish to the point you know, even when I became a Christian, that selfishness almost led to my marriage. And, you know, just it was a really dark time in my life. My wife and I, and it was, we, we struggled a lot, you know. And, and it was, uh, you know, and it was during that time that, you know, I had to ask myself that question, like, okay, you know, what am I changing? What is what is different about me now versus when I what, when I was when I wasn't a Christian, you know? And then there was, you know, and a lot had to change. It during that time, but then there was some things that were still the same, and selfishness was still yeah, a big, huge part of my life, and uh, and that was um, the thing for me that changed the most, you know, once I recognized that, that needed to go, and that needed to change, you know, I'm not going to say I'm not, not selfish now, I still, <laughs> I still battle with it, it's still what, something that's like a Achilles heel. Well, in what ways did that selfishness like manifest itself in your life? Did you? For me, it was, it was all about you know, self- Gratitude, you know, so I was always looking, looking out for, you know, myself. I, I didn't think of others before, before me, you know. And it was, you know, you know, it's, it was, it was just for me. It was just all about, you know, how can I please myself in this moment? You know, what makes Andre happy, you know? And uh, you know, even as a married man, saying that out loud, it's like, wow, that's sad. But, you know, that was my thinking, but that's kind of it was ingrained in me. It wasn't, it was, it wasn't something I was able to easily shake off. It was something that I had to work deliberately at to uh, to make a difference, you know. And and because of that, you know, like I was saying before, we, we, in my marriage, I'm say that, you know, because I was because I was so self focused, so so into myself, you know, it was it was, it was a real battle with my wife. As a Christian, um, did other people like notice this and talk to you about it, or was it something that you just were dealing with by yourself internally? It's one of those things. Um, in some cases, you know, people that were really close to me were able to pick it up and say, you know, hey, Audrey, this is like something you might need to look at or focus on. But in many other cases, you know, because you can portray a facade when you're at church, you can portray like I'm this super humble guy, or, you know, I'm this super nice guy, and everybody, everybody likes likes me, or, you know, that that kind of thing. But um, but the people that were really were really close to me and really into in my life, and it was only a few because I only let people get so close to me. At, at a certain point, you know, that, that selfishness was able to just run rampant, you know, and cause havoc. Do you think, like, even that component of not letting a lot of people into your life was a reflection of the selfishness, Absolutely. or was it just something else? Absolutely. No, that was definitely a part of it, um, because, you know, number one, I, I don't like to be told what to do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and if somebody's going to tell me what to do, or, you know, especially, you know, strong-minded brothers and sisters, you know, in my life that were, that were willing to call out my stuff, you know, and, you know, I avoided those people, you know, I didn't want to have deep relationships with those people, so I kept them at arm's distance, and, uh, and as a result, you know, I, I didn't change much. It's funny, I remember a brother sharing with me, like, you're, especially in marriage, like, your number one disciple partner is your spouse, right, so they, they, because they see everything, right, yeah. and so, I guess, how did that, like, what was, like, I guess the, the, the conflict there between, because I'm sure she, was probably trying to point you back to some of this. Like, how did <laughs> yeah, no, God bless, bless my wife. You know, she, she's been, she's awesome. You know, she, she, uh, you know, she 
prayer, fasting, you know, she called brothers, you know, to make sure that I was getting help. Oh, you know, she snitched. Oh, hell yeah. She called you up. One of my closest friends moved to Texas. She would call him on a regular basis. So, like, I couldn't escape him even, you know. Um, so, it was it was one of those things. Like, she was definitely a discipling partner, you know, definitely there for me to, to, have, to have my back. And then when all else failed, like, and, and, and that just wasn't working, you know, it, it, it was time to, you know, drop the hammer. And it was, you know, we, you know, we had a, a point in our marriage where we separated. I had to literally physically move out of the home because of because of my selfishness. So that you know that was like, and, and for her, you know, that was like, you know, get it right, you know, fix it, you know. And, and it was a wake up call for me because it was it was real, you know. Wow. And it, so it went from being you know all talk like ah Christians don't get divorced till oh wait a minute this is this is real like I need to fix this mm-hmm. in a hurry. So um, so that was a wake up call for me in in, 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 in many ways. So I was already working on things, but so I guess like now you guys are on the other side of this uh, what are some things like I guess like final words you would share with people that might find themselves in a similar situation that you're in um, just dealing with selfishness and uh, trying to embrace and really hold on and let the cross lead them to something different uh, what would you share like this is what I did this could help you like final words of words of encouragement for others I think final words, you know, there's power in the blood, right? Like that's, that's one of my favorite songs that we sing, you know, and I think if we allow the cross to really work in our lives, like, you know, amazing things will happen. And it sounds cliche-ish, but it's real, you know, like God's power is, is, is amazing, you know, when we really surrender ourselves to it and uh, allow it to affect us and, and, and learn and you know, learn from it, you know, I think big things, amazing things happen in our lives. You know, for me, in a real way, it's just opening up my heart again. You know, letting letting others in. You know, letting more people in, allowing others to challenge me. You know, there was a time when people would say something to me, and I would just in one ear and out the other. Now, actually, I hold it. You know, I think about it. You know, even if it's way off, I'm like, okay, there's something that this person might be seeing in me. Let me try to figure that out. And, uh, and so, having a different perspective on on it. You know, versus you know what I was like before, where you know I was just full of pride and arrogance. You know, now it's like, all right, let me let me listen, let me hear what, what people actually have to say, what people think about it. Trey, thanks for your vulnerability, man. That's big. <laughs> That's in the church. 
So this is a topic that's very uncomfortable. People don't want to talk about it. But like most things, you got to address it. I mean, Jesus addressed it. He dealt with this. And we got to understand the history of this, right? There's a big history with all of this. Um, you know, when you go back through the, uh, the Jews in Jerusalem, when they were taken into captivity by the Babylonians, they were there, trapped there for like about 70 years. They were turned back to Jerusalem. It took them about 20 years to rebuild the city. They rebuilt the city, rebuilt the walls, rebuilt the temple, uh, started trying to reestablish their religion and practice their faith. Uh, and it took about 100 years for them to get back to normal, right? Uh, some sense of normalcy, right? And with that, uh, their religion, once it got back to normal, they got back to normal, their religion also became more of a ritual rather than an actual like, belief in a practice. It was more like just ritual service, right? We understand this, right? You think about when you first came into the church, it was it. This was not like, it was it was special, right? First you get baptized, everything's like exciting, you were into it, you build the relationship. But after a while, it could become what? Routine. It could become routine. It could become just like them, a ritual, right? And this was really big for them, right? Malachi uh, is a is a post-exile prophet, they call him, but uh him and you know, so Malachi is pretty much the last book of the Old Testament. But it actually was going on at the same time as what other prophet? Anyone know this in the church? That's an OT history. Who? No. No. Nehemiah. Oh, Nehemiah. Right? They're actually going on around the same time. So Nehemiah is actually a lot later than most people do. Matter of fact, it could be looked at. Nehemiah is one of the last books of the Bible in chronological Old Testament, in chronological order, right? And so. You look at the two things that Malachi and Nehemiah was addressing of the people, one of the biggest issues that they had. And you know what the number one thing that they were, they were really addressing with the people? Nehemiah, after they built the wall and rebuilt the city towards the latter chapter, the last few chapters, you know what he's dealing with? Divorce. He ends that chapter really going in on them like you're divorcing your wives for this. And it's crazy because in the Old Testament, I mean, you know, divorce was, I mean, you could divorce over, over, over anything, <laughs> you know, like any issue under the sun. We'll talk more about that. But this was a big thing back then. The last chapter in Nehemiah was addressing this topic, right? And if you look at that, then you have 400 years of silence, right, pretty much before we get into the New Testament. And then we jump here into Mark where we are today, and we'll look at chapter 10, but leading up to this point, the Jews have already started rationalizing divorce again, uh, accepting it as a normal thing in their culture. And matter of fact, it wasn't just the Jew, that's the common people. You know who was leading the way in divorce during their time? It was the priests, the Pharisees. They were leading the way, so if they're doing it, then what? I guess everybody else. It's fair game. So this was a very common thing, especially amongst the priests. So now we get here. Mark 10. And Mark 10, I tell you, going into this, this was very interesting. We're going to see some, some real sinister things here. But um, Mark 10, verse 1, it says, Jesus left that place and he went into a region of Judea across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him. And as is his custom, he taught them, and other translations says he healed as well. Verse 2, it says, some Pharisees came to him and tested him, as they are accustomed to doing, right? We've been going through Mark for a long time, like Kenny likes to make fun of me about. And as we know consistently in Mark, who loves to test Jesus? The Pharisees, right? And the Sadducees, right? They love to come and test Jesus, and this is no different. This test is a little unique, though. Uh, it's actually a little more dark than most of the other tests that we've seen. They test him by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses command you? He replied. They said Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It's because of your hearts, because your hearts were hard, that Moses wrote, this, wrote you this law. Jesus replied, 
But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and a mother will be united with his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So there will no longer be two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. When they were in the house again, he asked, the disciples asked him about this. He said, he answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. So the scripture is pretty clear here. God's intention was pretty clear in the Old Testament. Don't divorce. And when we read this, it says something pretty heavy, like the next level here, where we pretty much says, and if you remarry, you are what? Wow. Now, this is one of the scriptures you could be like, okay, uh, how about we just shelve that <laughs> sometime later and uh, let's go on to the other things, right? Let's talk about some of the other stuff. But we have to examine this. You know, it's a trend. The world expects it. The world expects divorce. And the church allows it. Like, we could be honest, it's very common, we see it. There are many opinions about this, especially in the church. And I don't believe it should be as complicated as we made it out to be. Uh, Jesus was clear, and did, he didn't want the people to be confused when he talked about that. You know, so let's talk about this. How to get a divorce, right? That's the question. Many in the church have many reasons to justify it. And then there's people who are very hard-lined and conservative on this topic, right? And the hardliners pretty much say what? <laughs> Don't do it. No matter what. You know, I remember I was in seminary and a really, really popular teacher. Really popular teacher. I mean, this guy's a famous author, came and taught a class to us. And he was, he was clearly, you know, I mean, after an hour lecture, he was a hardliner on this. <laughs> This topic he didn't really beat around the bush. It was very clear. I mean, he went through. I mean, I gave like this short mini synopsis on the Old Testament stuff, but he, I mean, he went in on this with the Old Testament leading into Jesus and uh, and different things like that. So after an hour, over an hour long lecture, one of the students asked, "It wasn't me. He didn't ask this question. A student asked him this. It says, uh, what about Jesus' exception? Right? Jesus made an exception." Yeah. So what about Jesus' exception? He's like, oh, you're talking about Matthew 19. In Matthew 19, Jesus <laughs> made an exception in divorce. And so he asked the, the she, the student, asked this question. And his response was very unique to this. His response was very simple. He says, uh, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Now, again, I'm a student, we're students, we're sitting in the class, and we're just like, okay, well, he's a, uh, I mean, this is a well-known preacher, teacher, author, very famous guy, right? This is what he shared. And then he goes to tell a story about him, you know, growing up on a farm with chickens, right? And so he, he tells this story about chickens, and, and I, it's always stuck in my mind, because I'm like, I wish I had more courage back then. I would have asked a different question. But so he, he, uh, he tells a story about chickens, and he says, uh, you know, one day we left the gate open. We had chickens, a bunch of chickens. We left the gate open, went to bed, and I woke up the next morning, and guess what? The chickens were gone. They were gone. In that fact, they weren't even gone. There were some, some animals that ravished a few of them. We saw the bodies. And so he was like, so... With that being said, that's why I don't believe in the exception clause. I'm like, what? How you go from chickens running around in the open gate to the exception clause here? And his point was, it was clear, his point was this. He was like, the, the exception clause in his mind was what? An open gate. And if you leave that gate open, what's gonna happen to everybody? They're going to run out the gate, and they're going to get eaten up by a wolf. Right? They're going to be devoured. So, in his mind, it was 
don't have an open gate. Don't allow it. Don't allow the voice. And I was like, okay, uh, you know, that's interesting. So ask me what do I think about the exception clause? What do you think about the exception That's a great question. Thanks for asking me. Wow, I really encourage you guys to open the question for I believe it's in the Bible. Again, I, I do think we overcomplicate some things. Yeah. We like to overcomplicate some things, and, and you know why we do it. You know why we overcomplicate it, right? Yeah. Why do we overcomplicate things? It's here. Yeah, it's here. What about that? What, what we want? We want control. We want to do what we want to do. So if we can make it real complex, we can justify why we don't do certain things, right? That's just that's just the way it is, and it's it's fine. Own it. I always tell people, own it. Like just own. You don't want to do it, you don't want to do it, but don't try to justify it. This is real clear here, right? Jesus is real simple, it's in the Bible, I believe the Bible, I'm not a chicken, so I, hey, whatever, okay? It's the way it is, <laughs> you know? Uh, we don't make theological decisions based on gates and chickens, right? We make theological decisions based on what the Bible says, period. That's what we gotta do, and we gotta be okay with that. So, now that we got that out of the way, let's get into some deeper things here. Matthew 19, 1, let's talk about this exception clause here. Matthew 19, 1, just Jesus, when he had finished uh, saying these things, he left Galilee and he went into the region of Judea and to the other side of the Jordan, right? We've been talking a lot about Jesus and his travelings at this point in time. We talked about pretty much chapter 9 and 8. Jesus spent a lot of time in what city? Does anyone remember off the top of their head? There's a C. Galilee, right? You saw it? <laughs> Y'all like that bruise? Did you see? I did it. I wow, did it. I did the kid's song. <laughs> so, you know, uh, he finished his ministry in Galilee. Galilee, right? He was there for like three years doing ministry. And how did that end? It didn't end really well, right? We talked about that. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't the most celebrated lead that he had. Jesus has a tradition of pretty much when he leaves, he, he wasn't as, people weren't as happy when he left, right? Because uh, he challenged them, and he, he corrected, and he wasn't afraid to deal with things. Uh, and then he's going to here, and he's starting his Judean ministry. Uh, and that's pretty much when he'll stay for about six months before he actually is going to the cross and will be uh, killed at the cross. And so Matthew and Mark, they don't give much like information to us about what was going on during his time in Judea and Judea ministry. But Luke gives, and Luke and John give a little insight there. And it's funny because if you want to map this out, uh, you see his travel, he went to this location and it was called, it's funny, it's, uh, it's uh, what they call like the Perea ministry. Like you went to this area of Perea and in this area of Perea, it's very unique. You're like, okay, what's this obscure place that parents is bringing up? Why has this got to do with anything in divorce? Come on, right? So it's this little town near Jericho. And uh, that's where Jesus was going to make his final journey to Jerusalem. He's going to go through this town to make his journey to Jerusalem. What's funny about this, in chapter 10, uh, this is where he's at. He's in Perea. Now, there's something very unique about this city, this town. Very special. And it kind of highlights a really sinister plot to this whole encounter we're seeing here. See, the Galilean, the, 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 a lot of the Jews from Galilee, they were traveling down to Perea to avoid going to Samaria, right? And we know why Jews tend, don't want to go there. We've talked about that at, at length. Um, so we're not going to jump back into that. But obviously they're avoiding Samaria because they were trying to get to Jerusalem for what? Big holiday was coming up. Passover, right? And I think it's really good to start understanding some of these dates and locations because it helps to make sense. Remember when we read Mark 10, it said large crowds were gathering, right? Well, here's why there was large crowds. Because people were traveling in that location to get to Jerusalem. And we all know that at Jerusalem during Passover, what happened? This is Jesus' crucifixion. So Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Everyone else is on their way to Jerusalem. This is the path that everyone's going on for the Passover meal. You know, chapter 2, large crowds followed him and he healed there, teaching, healing about the kingdom. 
This is here. So here in Perea, Jesus is confronted with his arch enemy, the Pharisees, and they come with a deep question that they wanted to pose to him. They knew what to ask. And they knew where they were. And this is really deep. Because if you go through some of the history here, um, and we talked about this, divorce is very common among the leaders. It's common among the people. It was even common among the, the, the rabbis of their time. The rabbis practiced it. Right? Matter of fact, a lot of the rabbis' interpretation of the rule is what people follow. So the reasons for divorce, divorce, a couple of reasons, I'll give a couple of them, and they're pretty serious reasons here. I think we need to take some level of gravitas here, right? Uh, the first one is burning dinner. That was a <laughs> reason. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making this up. This is, these are true rabbinical reasons for divorce. Burning dinner, showing ankles, right? No showing of ankles, okay? Uh, and this could be in any reason. You could just be spinning around your ankle shows. Hey, that's it, girl. I'm done. Bye. Right? Uh, letting hair down. Let your hair down. Okay? I see a lot of pinned up hair here, so okay. Fine. <laughs> All right? Uh, speaking to a man. Negative talk about your mother. That's legit. These are legit <clears throat> reasons for divorce here. Or uh, unable to have children. Or finding someone else. <laughs> yeah, these are these are legit reasons, rabbinical reasons for divorce at that time. So, you know, um, in Matthew five, it talks about this, right? Jesus, Jesus addresses. He says, "If you divorce your wife without the clause, uh, you cause her to be an adulteress." Right? And so they knew. Mind you, here. A lot of these guys, they knew Jesus' stance already on divorce. They've heard it before. The Pharisees, they heard it. Jesus is his first time talking about it. He said it in Matthew 5. So why Matthew 16, Mark 10, why all the way down here? These are the same Jews that were coming from Galilee that have heard Jesus say this already, heard him teach on it. Why, when we're here in this city, the Pharisees want to bring it up? Yeah. Why are they bring? They already know his thoughts. And they know that when he said it in, in Matthew 5, it was real simple, right? You divorce your wife, you and you and her are now adulterous. Hard line. It was a hard line there. So they're like, oh, we know what he's going to say. Let's get him to say it here. The question you got to ask him is, why here? Why this place? Well, remember we talked about... Uh, we, did the sermon early on about the Pharisees, Sadducees, and then there's another group. Y'all remember the other group? The Herodians, right? And who are the Herodians? The politicians, right? Yeah, we put them in like a political group, but they were the the, the rulers, right? They're the kings, the, the rulers of the different areas uh, in Jerusalem and Judea, right? And there was one of the Herods was ruling there as Herod of Antipas. Does that ring a bell to anyone? He married his brother, sister. Ah! His wife. There we go. The ruler in this area was Herod of Antipas, right? And he was the guy that was hanging out. You know, he married, he lusted after his brother's wife, took her, married her, and he was confronted by who? John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And John the Baptist said what to this man? You're wrong. You can't marry her. You can't divorce your wife. You can't do that. And so as we know how this story goes, right? Uh, and, you know, it says uh, Mark 6, right? You read, read through this. And John the Baptist, again, this is Mark 6. I read through it. It says, uh, for Herod himself, had given orders to have John arrested and had him bound and put in prison. He did this because uh, Herodes, his brother, Philip's wife, whom he had married, for John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. John confronted him on this and it what? Cost him what? His life. 
he lost his head because of this. Now Jesus is here in this same city, probably right next to the, 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 the place itself. And these Pharisees are like, oh, we got a question for Jesus. We, we got a question for him. This is a good question, Jesus. What's your answer to this? They already knew it. They've heard it before. He said it, but they said it there. Why do you think they chose to do that in this sense? Yeah. It was setting them up. They're in this territory. They knew this was sinister. They're like, Jesus is going to say the same answer he said before, and it's going to rile up the whole audience, the crowd. It'll get back to Herod himself. Maybe his girl will hear that and be like, there's another one here. You need to. Because as you remember the story, the guy actually was listening to John the Baptist, right? Y'all remember that? He actually was like, no, I kind of, I, I hear what he's saying. I, I might need to change. And she was like, uh-uh, you ain't messing up a good thing. <laughs> right? Yeah. And it was, it was it set him up for this. And so this is what happened. So this was really deep. And I love that Jesus responded the right way because he's so good. He knew exactly how to respond to them. And how does he respond? Verse 3, he says, <laughs> I love it. What does Moses command you? Why is that so unique? What did he point them back to? Huh? Yeah, to the law. Oh, you want a problem with me? I have a problem with Moses. What did Moses say? He pointed them right back to that. He didn't address the culture. He didn't deal with what the culture is saying is right and wrong. What the rabbis were teaching about what's right and wrong. He didn't go into the rabbinical justifications for divorce. He didn't go into the cultural justifications for divorce. He said, what does the law say? Yeah. And as Christians today, we gotta be, we have to have that same type of conviction. We get really caught up, and again, I love to, y'all know me, when I preach, I love to dig in the culture. I think there's some, there's some very important things that we need to understand about culture, but we also have to make sure that we are not foregoing the scriptures to honor what? Culture. And there's some reasons why that we're going to talk about a little bit today. This is obviously going to be a two-part message because I can't finish it all now. But, um, you know, he addressed it with straight up with the scriptures. He went straight through their customs, right through their traditions, and straight to the word. What does God say? Verse 4, it says, Then they said, Moses permitted the man to write a certificate of divorce and send her on her way. And he goes on to tell them, yeah, he said that because... Of your heart. And then he goes in and he starts reading again. He goes in and he starts pulling what? Genesis. Genesis. Right back to the scriptures. He goes right back to the scriptures. starts pulling Genesis. This is what it said in Genesis. And so, you know, th th these different reasons why God hates divorce. And, and I think there's some big things that we have to understand. I think it helps us to understand to break down a little bit of what he laid out here, right? The first one, he, he says, haven't you read? I love that. This is what I was just talking about. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female? And he was like, look, God created us. And God created this union. That's something that you have to understand. That this union is something that is created by God. It was his intention, always. Um, and then he goes on, he says, you know, with the strength of the union, which I think we, we underestimate. It says in verse 5, and he said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife. In that script, in that word, that united with his wife, it talks about being glued together and pursuing one another. It's a kinship. You know, um, the word uh, kadishina is the word that's used there. You know, like that, the little Greek, and they're trying to be like Andre. You know, yeah. like, the little Greek, and you know, and which is uh, when something is uh, as kadishina, that is uh, consecrated for God, right? It's, it's for Him, exclusively for Him, right? Consecrated for God, and that's the word that they use for marriage. That is consecrated for God. It's for Him. 
And he goes on, and then he says this. He says, uh, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And this is deep, man. I think, you know, we can look at this stuff from a real practical level. I can leave you, and then I'm separated. I'm still an individual. I am my own person. I'm separate from you. But, you know, the things that we don't catch in marriage, which is really deep, and what the intention was always, was that that marriage, we even talk about the consecration of a marriage, right? They talk about that term, right? And what is that, what is that term? Consecration, when you consecrate your marriage, you, right? And we know, right? Y'all get what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying? Let's make sure you get what I'm saying. Gotcha. You got what I'm saying. That's part of the consecrating the marriage. What comes from that consecration process? What's something that could potentially come from that? Child. child. Think about this child. Think about this child. How this Bible says, but God brought together, no man can separate. It's really unique on what a child represents in a marriage, right? Or what a child represents in a relationship, period. Because now we people have children outside of the marriage, whatever. But when you have that oneness process, who can separate you from your child? Who can separate that woman from that? There's no dividing that. Right? Even if you two can't stand each other, that child is always what? A living representation of that union. Period. Period. You go your way, she goes her way, whatever. That is always there. And matter of fact, the dysfunction of that unity, what, affects who? God's saying something here. God's saying something here. He's saying, this is why I don't play with divorce. This is why this stuff is dangerous. You separate, you're, you're affecting legacy. It's bigger than you, what I'm trying to do here. And what's moving on. There's so much more. Things get affected. Your marriage matters. That is serious. So he goes on, he talks about this. The two will become one flesh so long and no longer two, but one. And we sometimes forget that all of this is an act of God. It's all an act of God. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. This is a work of God. Don't break up your marriage. And don't break up someone else's marriage. And that's big. That's big. You know, God put them together. God wants, and, 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 and when God puts that together, when you are come together in marriage, and that's something that's a God thing, and we acknowledge that's a God thing, when you undo that, you're undoing a what? You're undoing a God thing. And that's big. You know, and it's funny, man, when you go through some of the Old Testament scriptures and the consequences for adultery, and this is heavy, man. Like in Leviticus, the consequences for adultery is death. It's death. You know, Exodus 20 talks about do not, it's a command, right? Ten commandments, do not commit what? Adultery. adultery. Leviticus 20, it says, in verse 10, it says, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, they should both be killed. Like, that's serious. And here's the funny thing. So it's like, okay, that's adultery, right? That's marriage. But you know what it says for if you have sex outside of marriage? You know what the consequence is? In Leviticus 19.20, the consequence is just, uh, you know, they got to give a sacrifice. Scourging, they got to sacrifice and, and ask for forgiveness. Isn't that deep? That the consequences for this, it, we look at it as an act. They both did the same thing. They just had sex. That is the same thing. That's what we look at it as. But the way God looks at it is like, Oh no, it's bigger than that. You you're you're breaking a, a covenant. You're breaking a work of mine. And I'm like, that's the, the, the levels of this. It's really intense. You just even look at like that aspect. Even the last commandment is really unique. We look at it as, you know, thou shalt not covet. But if you read the last commandment and what it says, what does it specifically say? Do not covet what? 
another man's wife. Don't break up someone's marriage. Don't break up yours and don't break up someone else's. Two commandments of the ten are pertaining to that. God is really serious about this. And I don't think we sometimes don't take it as serious as God does. Even the desire to break up a marriage is not allowed. Matthew 5, 28, Jesus even said himself, said, if you look at a woman lustfully, you've done what? Committed adultery in your heart. You know, it's a violation. You know, so we got to ask, okay, we get it. So God is very clear about marriage, but it's not easy, right? <laughs> it's not easy. It's really hard. There's stuff that happens, some serious stuff really serious stuff, really bad things happen, mm -hmm. right? Marriage in some cases, if we be, just keep it 100 here, it can bring out some of the ugliest yeah. things in people. We've seen this. Some have even experienced it. You know, why does this happen? Maybe point blank period, we're all sinners. This is why divorce happens. This is why we know these separations happen. This is why stuff goes down, because we're sinners. It's, it's real. And marriage is full of conflict. It's funny. I didn't want to share this, but it's such a unique point. And I, I kind of want to talk about this. So whatever. We're going to go on to it. Uh, <laughs> sometimes you got to talk yourself into it. Like, yeah, let's, let's talk about it. Yeah. So Genesis 3, right? We were cursed because of what happened with Adam and Eve, right? They did something bad, and we're paying for it. Man was cursed with work, and a woman was cursed with her desire to be for her husband and birth pain, right? Some real serious things here. Verse 16 is very unique, though, and I want us to kind of examine this. In Genesis 3, verse 16, when he gives the curse out here, I never really looked into this curse. I was reading this book. It's called The Divorce Dilemma. It's a really, really interesting book about this, and um, I started digging into even just this concept of the curse that was that fell upon Eve. It says your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Now I stopped and I thought about that. I was like, I never really understood that as a curse, really. Right? Like isn't it good to desire somebody? Like, that's good, right? Desiring? That's a good thing. Now the ruling, okay, I get it. I understand that. Ruling, no, ain't nobody want to be ruled over. But the desire for her, uh, is that really good? Like, I didn't get it. Now, some of the women looking at me like this. I don't want to be desired. Okay, yeah, whatever. I didn't understand it. Here's the weird thing with this. I always thought it was a weird curse. But that word desire is very funny. Because it's only used one other time in the Pentateuch, which is the, the first, you know, five books, the Levitical laws, right? So it's only used one other time. You know what other time that word desire is used? When talking about Cain and Abel, when God told him, he said, sin wants to what? <laughs> wants to, sin desire, desires to have you yeah. and master you. But you must what? Master it. It's the only other time that word desire there. And it was deep because I was like, oh wow, what this is saying is that there will be a desire to master in the relationship. Like there's a desire to master over in the relationship. And there and here goes this conflicting consequence that happens consistently of ruling powers. When God created man and woman, he said this, it was never a ruling over. It was always equal partnership. Right. When God created us, and God's original plan was like, it wasn't, I want Adam to name all the animals and do all the work. It was like, no, I created a helper for you. Y'all doing this together. This is a co-work that y'all are going to be doing. Y'all are going to subdue the earth together. Perfect unity. Perfect teamwork. It's going to be great. You know what I mean? Mutual submission to accomplish the goal. That's the team. That's the ideal. But because of what happened, now there's going to be an internal conflict that happens consistently. He will rule over you. The, 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 this, was, this was huge. 
Because now we have a concept where this desire that we see in Genesis 4, 7, desire, sin desires to have you and you must control it. She wants to control and you have to master. I was like, wow, what? What is that? So it says here, like, a woman seeks to be independent and dominant, and men try to rule with authority and dominating control. Now you have this conflicting marriage where you have men with this over-dominant, controlling, trying to rule. You're going to do it my way, but then you have women. No, I want it my way. And it's this conflict, this consistent conflict of wills clashing in a marriage. Clashing. Consistently. And there's not mutual submission. Period. And so this is where we got to kind of go back where like, you know, male chauvinism and female liberation is like, okay, where is this? We see it in society. Right? With men overly exerting authority and power and women just like, I, no, you know, I don't need you. There's more of a concept of I don't need and I want to control than a mutual submission and working together. Mutual building up and, and you get, see, God had an original plan. If marriage is supposed to reinforce that, but now we have broken it and we don't even consider it a God work. It's a man's work or a human work. And the institution is not valued the way God originally and always intended for it to be. So now we deal with this. Broken family, broken relationships, broken people. No submission, no understanding, no love for God and God's original plan. Matter of fact, we work more to destroy God's work than we are to build it up. We work more to justify my liberation and my leadership versus um, how can I support and build you up? How can I be there for you? I want my right. I'm not thinking about our right. This is where we are as a society. We really are there. And it breaks my heart because sometimes I feel like we've created a world where men and women are fighting against each other. Right. Literally, it's a war against men and women. And I'm like, this was never God's intention. This was never God's intention. We got to pray to be able to restore this. Amen. And this is why our marriages matter. This is why marriages matter. A marriage that does not submit themselves under the ruling and reign of Christ will only subject themselves to the wave of the culture. Right, right. It'll only subject themselves to the wave of the culture. Mm -hmm. And this demand to rule over and master each other will be the end of the marriages. And like I said, the people that suffer the most are the children. Because they're the un, unflicting consequence of that relationship, right? Your union doesn't end. <laughs> that it goes on forever. Forever. Through them. Forever. There's a few more things we're going to talk about with this. Um, but we'll talk more about that next week. <laughs>